I met Ted this past fall when he took uh, my Bio 190 environmental science course. He was an excellent student who was very interested in, in outdoor pursuits and environmental sustainability. Those are sort of two topics that go hand in hand. And so he came to me this winter interested in doing an independent study project with me. And he also brought along Todd Pershing from the Baraboo Range Preservation Association who sort of helped us uh, with his experience in the area and knowledge of invasive species here um, to help develop this project that Ted really started and did a great job and really got some nice data collected and did some restoration as well. So Ted will come down here and tell you about it. Hello everyone. Uh, basically what my project is, is identifying and quantifying the invasive species around this cathartic in the forested area southeast of the Baraboo campus, which is also just north of the tennis courts, or if you play disc golf, it's a uh, plot of land I used, was uh, just off the 11th tee. <laughs> Alright, so around this cathartic has a few names which it's referred to, it's uh, called common buckthorn, and glossy buckthorn. Uh, European buckthorn and Carolina buckthorn. Uh, for this, I'm just going to refer to it as buckthorn. Uh, buckthorn came over here in the mid 1800s. It was brought here from Europe and Asia. It was used as a hedge plant and as a decoration, decorative plant. Uh, buckthorn is basically invades wetlands, prairies, river valleys, and agricultural areas. You can see on the map here, Wisconsin. The green colored areas are the counties that are currently uh, housing this species, and it's it's spreading quickly through this area. Uh, buckthorn is an invasive plant species that outcompetes native plants for sunlight, moisture, and other nutrients. It degrades the wildlife habitat where it is. It contributes to erosion by shading out other areas, uh, other plants that grow in on the forest floor. Uh, it leaves our base, they form an impenetrable layer, which you can see on this bottom picture. Everything that's green there is buckthorn. So it makes it difficult for uh, the flora uh, forest species to grow. And it also has no natural controls over it, like pests or disease that will help eradicate itself like other uh, species do. Uh, buckthorn is part of the Rimnaceae family. It uh, comes in small trees and shrubs, which range from 1 to 10 meters in height. The leaves are, which you can see here on the bottom left, 3 to 15 centimeters, and the veins curve up slightly upwards towards the tip of the leaves. Uh, it also produces a blackberry, which is very important to this species, because this blackberry is how it's transported to other areas. Birds will come in, other animals eat the berries, fly away, digest it, and wherever they excrete that berry, it'll then grow, and this plant will then you know, be reproduced all over the place. And they also, as you see at the end, they have a thorn that comes up through the separation of the twigs there, which is where it gets its name, buckthorn. Uh, for identifying this plant, when we went out into the woods on our plot of land, and the season we went out there, the, the berry is still on the, uh, on the plant at this time. So you can look for the berry, otherwise you can use the thorns, which are pretty identifiable, although you have to pull the branches down to actually find them sometimes, or they have been broken off, so the thorns aren't always on it. And, but in the winter time, the easiest way to do it is by looking at its bark. So the older growth bark, as you can see on the left here, has a very flaky composition to it. When you move into the young saplings, saplings, which is the next picture, it's a glossy bark, which has these little white cork-like uh, attributes to it. But the best way to do it is just to either take your knife out or use your fingernail on a, like a younger sapling and cut the bark, and it'll produce. It'll show you like a, it'll show you this yellow sapwood on the inside with an orange hardwood, which really makes it stand out in the woods for identifying it uh, compared to other plants. So to for the uh, plots, which I'm doing to uh, identify this plant, then you know quantifying it, I'm trying to find a way to. Uh, trying to find a way where I can find the smallest plot size available to produce uh, a group of the best estimate of an entire plot. So I do that through the modified Whitaker plot design. It's basically you just take one large plot and then inside of that you have many subplots. And these are the sizes. Of, the one large plot is 15 by 30 meters. Here I have basically an uh, outline design of these plots overlaid on top of each other. So we start with the 15 by 30. And then from there we introduce a center plot which is 5 by 10. And then with the outliers, the outlying plots there on the corners are five meters by five meters. And then inside of that, we use the a two by two. And inside of each one of those, we use a one by one in hopes that we can, you know, use the data from each one of those plots, which will give us a better estimation of the entire plot by itself. Uh, this is actually the location of the plot. You can aerial view of campus, north, south, east, west. 
Remember, I refer to the edges as the southern edge and the northern crest for this. And here we're moving into the data I collected. Now, the uh, circles up here on the right, the red, the yellow, and the uh, blue represent uh, the one meter plots and the sizes of these range from one to two, as you can see. So the size associates with the color and also the, the sizing of the, uh, of the circle to give us how many are in that exact plot. So you can see with the uh, one, one meter squared plots that they only show up sporadically throughout this. And the same thing happens when we move to the two meter stuff, the two meter square plot. So when we're trying to estimate a total plot design off of that, it doesn't provide us with, with enough data or even, you know, enough data in multiple areas to be able to estimate the whole one. But when we see the five meter square plot, it comes up and all in, on the southern edge, on the northern and the central plot, it's everywhere. So that's the that is the plot size I use to then later estimate. Which we can see over here, this is this is our southern edge plot. So we take looking at these two plots, adding the total up of the plant abundance in them, which gives us around 24. So on the southern edge, we see that it has a nice, you know, a nice plant abundance. When we move into the center, it moves up, it jumps up to almost 30. And then when we climb up the hill through our elevation, we see it falls off drastically into you know, only 14 plants. From there, we take that data and we pump it through some equations so we can get our estimation. So once again, we're taking our southern edge. Actually, well, let's go to here for a second. The actual plot data for the entire plot, including all the outlying areas, all this that's light blue, and every all the subplots, we came up with. I counted every single plant in that whole entire plot, and I got 100. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> and I got 188 total plants of our uh, plot board in that entire plot. So then, to find out a way to estimate it. You know, off of our small spot size available, I went in and I took the two small, uh, these two southern edge five uh, meter squared plots, combined the total of those plants, which was 24, and then divided them by the area that they take up of our total plot, which is 50, uh, and then multiplied it by the entire plot itself, which gives us uh, an act, which gives us an estimation based off our southern edge of 216. I just did that in multiple ways. Uh, went to the northern crest where we had the uh, Smallest plant abundance did the same equation, total of 14 plants divided by the area of 50, multiplied by the entire area, and it came up with 126, which is both those are not near what we're looking for at 188. So when we did the center one, which was our largest plant abundance, it skyrocketed when we did that equation, 30 plants, you know, by 50 to 400, and then multiplied by 450. It gave us an uh, estimation of the total plot of 270, which is extremely off. But when we took all the outlying five meters, the northern crest and the southern, and did the same equation. What we came up with was 171 total plants. Started with 38, divided or multiplied, divided by the area, and multiplied by the total area. And we came up with 171, which is extremely close to our, we're, we're extremely close to our initial uh, count of the entire plot. Which basically, by doing it that way, we're able to predict this uh, entire plot uh, at 91% accuracy. So after we do all that, we collect all the data, we move into the, probably the funnest slash hardest part of the project, which is doing the land reclamation. And what I have here is a time-lapse video of Todd and I uh, reclaiming the land. So basically what we're going through doing in this video is removing all of those 188 species, species of plants of the Rhinus cathartic or buckthorn and putting it back to uh, like a, a natural forest, a natural Wisconsin forest. So I'll play that for you so you can see. It provides a before and after picture pretty much of what it looks like. So you can see us running through the woods, <laughs> cutting everything down, removing everything. As we're doing this, we're using uh, 32 inch and 18 inch loppers. We're using a saw and we're cutting everything down and laying it across the forest floor, which it'll, do, it'll uh, degrade by itself uh, by in about a year or two. So it'll naturally decompose and take care of itself. Um, when we have the exposed stumps, we usually we try to cut them off as close as we can to the ground. And then we apply an herbicide to the, to the exposed stumps within five to ten minutes to be most effective. And that will also kill the root systems of those plants so they don't regrow. The smaller plants that we do through here, we are just pulling out, which, you can, which are pretty easy to pull out of the ground, shaking out the soil, and then throwing them to the side. And within 
10 minutes of that, those roots being exposed to the air, they, they're dead. They pretty much instantly die. So from here, what we're really looking at in the beginning here, we can see what we're looking for is the central area, which are these, right in this area here, are these three large oaks, which you can't really see at all. So if you, I'm going to play it again and not speak so you can watch this and just sort of focus on that and see how much it opens up. So in opening up this area that before was basically closed off by all the vegetation and all the buckthorn, it's going to help to reintroduce wildlife that hasn't lived there in quite a while. It'll give birds that uh, hunt gnats and a way to actually sweep down from the trees and come in and, uh, and hunt those. And hunt those. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, so after, you know, so now we have it, uh, we've reclaimed the land and we're back to uh, the natural forest. And what we have here is, I'm just going to show you a before and after picture of, of the work we did again. These are sort of, it shows you, this is the southern edge where we had a large plant abundance leading it. And then, so this is the before and this is what it looks like today. And this is, this will help promote uh, native plant growth inside there because they won't be shaded out anymore. They'll be able to soak up the sun, also get the moisture that they need to grow. It'll also help the oak trees that are there grow in a much, uh, in a much better way than they currently do. And then this is our northern crest facing down towards the disc golf course, which you can barely see the grass, which is on the disc golf course there. And there's how it looks today. So in closing, what we're looking to do was find a small plot that would give us a better estimation of a large plot, then, which then you can extrapolate that to any size plot that you're really looking to, to learn about or to, uh, to reclaim the land from. And we did that. So we found that using the five meter squared plots and placing them on, in multiple areas will give us a proper estimation of the entire plot. Uh, I'd also like to, again, thank Todd. If you give a little wave, come on, show it. There he is. Uh, Todd's work, Todd works with the Bear Wood Range Preservation Association and works on projects like this on many other projects. So if any of you are interested in doing something like that or you know want to be a part of basically any kind of environmental thing in the area, Todd's, Todd's, the, yeah, Todd's the man to talk to. And uh, he all, he's always looking for volunteers. So thank you very much.